I'm in the process of building a basic computer using a version of the 6502 microprocessor, and so far I've just programmed it to blink some LEDs like this. And the program I wrote that's doing this is stored on this ROM chip. Or really, it's a programmable ROM chip, so we can actually change the program. But if we pull the chip out, we can put it in a programmer and take a look at what's on it. So this is an AT28C256 chip. So we just go to uh, read here and read the device. Here's the program that was running. You know, it's just a bunch of hexadecimal numbers, but of course they have meaning. So A9 means to load the next byte into the A register. So this is going to load uh, FF into the A register. 8D means to store the contents of the A register into the address uh, in the next two bytes here. And so on until we get to this 4C0580, which obviously means to loop back and keep repeating this. Well, if that doesn't seem so obvious to you, then you're not going to be surprised to hear that no one actually writes software this way, even for you know, really low-level stuff like this. Now, in my last video, I actually did write this program by writing out the machine code here by hand, you know, with a little bit of uh, Python code down here to sort of massage it into a binary file of the, of the appropriate size. But of course, you know, it just isn't practical to write machine code by hand like this for you know, anything more complex. Instead, the way to do this is to write our program using assembly language. So we can actually just say load a ff and store a 6002 or you know whatever else we want. And then we can use an assembler, which is just a program that will convert this to machine code without us having to worry about what all the different opcodes are. So of course we're going to need an assembler. And there are a number of different assemblers out there for the 6502. So I'm going to use this thing called VASM. It's, you know, it looks like it's actively maintained. It's uh, written by Volker Barthelman, and uh, a lot of work on the 6502 stuff was done by Frank Willa. But you can see, you know, it supports the 6502 family. Uh, it supports a number of different syntax flavors. I'm going to be using the old 8-bit style syntax. And it'll give us this raw binary uh, output, which is what we need in order to write to our uh, EEPROM. But in any event, you can download the source code from the website here and compile it yourself. So I've got it downloaded here. We can just do make. Um, or actually, we have to do uh, CPU equals 6502, and uh, syntax is old style. And we get a few warnings, but uh, that should generate this file here, which is the actual assembler. And so if we run that, you can see, okay, it wants an input file. And so you can either compile this yourself, or if you go back to the website and go to Volker's uh, page here, he's got um, binaries here for Mac, Windows, and Linux for the 6502. So you can just download that, and that ought to be what you need. So once we have the assembler, now let's run it to translate this assembly language program, uh, just this, this two-line thing I've written here, into uh, a raw binary file that we can put on a ROM. So let me save this. So now if we run the assembler with that file, there it goes. And uh, so what did it do? Well, by default, it puts its output into a file called a.out. So if we take a look at that, we can see it's actually a text file that has a bunch of stuff in it, and it does have the opcodes here spelled out in, in hexadecimal, but this is just a text file. You know, we, we can't put this on the EEPROM directly like this. You know, we need, a, we need a binary file. But if we go take a look at the documentation for the assembler, you can see there's a, a bunch of options, and one of those options is dash f format to use a particular output format. And it says, see the chapter on output drivers for more details, but if we take a look at the, uh, let's see, there's an output module here for simple binaries. Let's take a look at that. And here it says the simple binary output module can be selected with the dash F bin option. So let's do that. So I'll run the assembler again with the dash F bin and our file name. And now if we look at a.out, well now it just looks like a couple unknown characters. I guess this is, this is the contents of the file, which is sort of what we expect, right? It's just a binary file with a couple instructions in it. So let's do a hex dump to see exactly what's in there. And here we go, we've got our program. So A9 is the opcode op for load A, uh, FF. And then 8D is the opcode for store A, and then it's got the 6002 here. And so that matches the program that we wrote. Now, a couple things I'll point out here in the program before I get too far is you see there's a hash symbol here and then the dollar signs. And these have meaning to the assembler. So the dollar sign here, for example, means that the number is hexadecimal. So if I left off this dollar sign, and this would be address 6002 decimal, not address 6002 hexadecimal, which is what we want. And then the, the hash sign up here means that this load A is a load immediate, meaning it's loading the value FF into the A register. And if, and if I left off this hash symbol, then this would actually mean to load whatever data is at address FF, or, or really address 00FF, load, load whatever's at that memory address into the A register. Um, so, I, so actually, let me leave the, the hash symbol off and save this and show you what that does. So if I go back and, and just rerun the assembler and take a look at the hex dump, you can see instead of having you know this instruction being a9ff, 
It's now instruction A5FF, so it's actually a different opcode, even though the only thing we changed was, was just lead, leaving off this hash symbol that was here. You know, so getting rid of that hash symbol actually changes the opcode. So if we look at the data sheet for the microprocessor, we can see A5 is still an opcode for the load A instruction, just like A9. But where A9 is, is sort of under this, you know, go figure, it's a hash uh, column here, uh, that means immediate data. A5 is ZP, which is zero page, which you know means it's loading from an address that starts with 00. zero. Uh, in this case, it would be 00FF, which you know, is very different from what we want. So it turns out that hash symbol is pretty important here. But anyway, now if we want to recreate the rest of that Blink program that we started with, we can just continue to do that in assembly language here. So I can put a 55 hex into the A register, which is just the alternating ones and zeros, and then store that out to address 6000, which will put it on the LEDs and then load AA, which is the other alternating bits, and then store that to, to put that on the LEDs. And at the bottom, I had a jump instruction here to create a loop. So that's pretty much what we had before, but instead of us having to look up and type in the actual hex opcodes, we're using these mnemonics, so it's you know much easier to read and write. Now, one thing I'll point out that, that maybe isn't that obvious is that each line here has some spaces at the beginning. It turns out to be really important that each instruction has some spaces or a tab or something in front of it like this. Otherwise, the assembler will give you all sorts of errors. And I'll get into why that is in a minute, but you definitely want to make sure you've got some blank space at the beginning of each line. So let's save this and go ahead and assemble it. And now if we hex dump the output, uh, here's what we get. And it's more or less identical to what we have in the ROM. And in fact, if we take a look at that, you can see these first 18 bytes here, the, first, you know, the, the actual program itself, is identical to what was in the ROM. But of course, the ROM image is more than 18 bytes. In fact, it's 32,768 bytes, and it has to be exactly that size because that's how big the, the EEPROM that we're using is. Also, at the end here, at, at FFFC, well, well, it's 7FFC and 7FFD in the ROM, which is going to appear at address FFFC and FFFD in memory, uh, this is the, the reset vector. And this, you know, this 0080 is what tells the processor where to start executing code you know, at, at address 8000. So our assembler is giving us this, but we, you know, we need all this padding here to get the file to be exactly 32K long, uh, and we need this 0080 here. So how can we do that? Well, this is something the assembler actually makes really easy for us. You know, if we go back to our code, we can use the origin direction, which is .org, and this origin directive tells the assembler where the, the following code goes in memory. So at the very top here, I can say, you know, org 8000, and, and this says the next statement, you know, this load A here, is going to be at address 8000. And the reason we want to say that the first instruction is at address 8000 is because even though it's the first instruction in the, in, in the first byte of the ROM here, remember the ROM is only enabled when the processor sets the top address line, A15, when it sets that high. And so if A15 is a 1, but all the rest of these address lines are all zeros, all these address lines here are all zeros, then that's what's going to give us the first byte out of the ROM, right? The ROM is, is enabled and we're, and we're getting uh, the first byte out of it. But from the processor's perspective, it's not reading address zero, it's reading address 8000. So this org directive at the top just tells the assembler, hey, you know, the processor is going to think that the code in this file starts at address 8000, which, which is fine. But now we can do another org directive down here at the bottom for address FFFC, which says that the next thing after this goes at address FFFC. So right here after that org directive, we want to just tell the assembler, just put the address 8000, because that's the start address we want to have at this you know, FFFC position. And we can do that with the dot word directive, which just puts a word, which is just a 16-bit value, into the, the output. So we can say word 8000. So now if we save this and assemble this, whoops, assemble it, um, we get some errors here. So unknown mnemonic, so dot org, dot word, it doesn't understand. And that's because we actually need to tell the assembler we want to use these directives with dots in front of them. So what we want to do is use the uh, dash dot dir option here. And okay, there we go. So now let's take a look at the output. So if we do a hex dump of a dot out, and there we go. We've got the first, the first 18 bytes are the same. That's our program. And then we have a whole bunch of zeros all the way up to FFFC and FFFD, which is now the, the 0080. So this is uh, almost exactly what we want. It's actually two bytes short because <laughs> we need two more bytes here to get the file to be exactly 32,768 bytes long. Um, but, you know, that's easy enough. We can just add another word uh, to the end here. Um, you know, it could be whatever. And now let's assemble this and do a hex dump. And there we go. So it's the right length, right? So 7FFF is, is the last byte here. It's got the 0080 in the right place for the reset vector. 
and it's got our program here at the beginning. So of course now we could just write this file to the EEPROM like, like we have in the, in the previous videos and run the program. But there's still a few more things we can do to make things even easier for us. So if we go back to our code, one thing that's really tricky about this is we have this jump 8005 here. And the goal of that is to create a loop out of this block here. And so the, the 8005 is supposed to be the address where this load A is. But you know, I only know that because I know, well, we're starting at 8000 8, and the load A is one byte, uh, and this, this FF is, is one byte, and the, the store A, this is three bytes. And so then this must be 8005. But you know that that's a just a bug waiting to happen. <laughs> you know, as soon as anything changes, this the address of this instruction could change. So instead, we can actually have the assembler keep track of all that. So I could uh, put a label here, call it loop, and then instead of jumping to address eight zero zero five, I can just jump to that label loop. And now that's way better. So it's much easier to tell what's going on here. So we have you know a loop here, uh, and because we're not hard coding that address, if this code moves around in the future, then it, nothing's going to break. And now you may have noticed that unlike every other line in this file, this uh, label here is not indented. And that's very much intentional because that's how the assembler knows that it's a label. Now, if we want, we can add another label at the top here for the initialization code. And then down here at the bottom for our reset vector, instead of hard coding that, we can just use that reset label. So let's save this and assemble it again. And then we take a look at the output. You can see it's the same as before. So that jump, that 4C0580 is the same. It's still using address 8005, but now we, you know, we didn't have to keep track of that and figure that out on our own. And of course the reset vector here is still 0080, so, that, so that's the same as well. So hopefully you'll find this code here to be much more legible and maintainable than just the raw listing of hex codes that we started with. So, so for example, we can actually change this program pretty, pretty easily now. So um, let's let's make some changes here. So after we initialize the interface adapter here, let's let's output something right away. So I'll do five zero hex and output that. And then in the loop, what I'll do is a rotate right instruction. And then this instruction just by itself will shift all of the bits in the A register to the right. You're rotating the rightmost bit back around to, to the left. And then once we do that, what I can do is uh, we'll just store the modified A register uh, back to address six zero 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 to to put it out on the LEDs. And I'll get rid of the rest of this and that'll actually just be our loop there. So this whole program is, you know, we're initializing the interface adapter here. Uh, we're, we're outputting the five zero hex pattern uh, to, the, to the LEDs. And then in our loop, we're just, uh, you know, essentially just shifting that pattern to the right and, and rotating it around. So we should see something kind of interesting on the LEDs with that. So let's save this and I'll run the assembler again. And then uh, do a hex dump of the output there. And if we look at what we've got here, I've got A9, which is load A, FF. And then we have our 8D, which is store A, uh, 0260, um, which is actually, uh, you know, another nice thing about the assembler is, you know, it's uh, figuring out how to put this in the, the little endian format, the sort of backwards format, because this is address 6002. And of course, in our code, you know, we just type 6002. We don't have to think about the fact that it has to be stored in this sort of backwards format in the, in the hex file. But anyway, then we've got load A, 50, store A, 6000. Uh, then this 6a uh, opcode, that's got to be the opcode for rotate right. And then another store a, uh, 6000. And then our, our jump. So 4c is jump, but this time we're jumping to, uh, well, it's going to be 800a. But of course, we didn't have to worry about figuring that out. The assembler just knew, you know, that's the right place to jump to, to get back to the loop label, which, which I guess would be sort of here-ish. So let's see what this program does. Let's write it to the EEPROM. There we go. Now I'll put the EEPROM back in our circuit here and power it up. I'll reset. Okay, there's the five. And yep, there it goes. So it's got those two bits from the, the five zero and it's rotating them right, which <laughs> it looks like it's going left because I've got the, the bits sort of swapped around here on you know physically but it's rotating it right. And you'll see this bit now goes into the carry bit and then the carry bit comes back. So there's actually sort of a, a hidden ninth bit in this rotation, which is the carry bit. But otherwise that's what our program's supposed to do. And of course now being able to write programs in assembly language for this little computer we're building means that we'll be able to do something more complex than just blinking some LEDs, or at least it'll be easier for us to write programs that are a little bit more complex. Not to say that blinking LEDs can't be fun, but in the next video, I'm gonna hook these uh, control signals up to this LCD display, and we'll be able to write a program a little bit more easily to control it and actually display some, some more interesting text. And remember, if you wanna follow along with these videos and build and program your own little computer, 
I've gathered all the parts together that you'll need and, and uh, you can buy them on my website as, as a kit. Uh, it comes with everything you'll need to build the, the basic computer. And I've also got a kit for the, the clock that I'm using here as well. So you can check out eater.net slash 6502 for more information on all of that. And as always, thanks to all my patrons since your support is also critical in making these videos possible.